But hey, so we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 15, and uh, probably eventually you're going to see a taco guy pull up behind me, so please don't be distracted by tacos, okay? They'll be here soon. But obviously, today's a different day. We're all together in one place. We're in the park. We're not in a building. And so in light of that, I wanted to take some time to do something a little bit different this morning in terms of what we're going to look at in this passage and, and ask a question about something that we don't necessarily think a whole lot about, but it determines a lot of the what we understand about who God is in our life. And that is, how do you and I uh, actually connect to God? How do we relate to God? Now, you might probably don't think a whole lot about that. You think, okay, well, if, if I made a commitment to follow Jesus, I know who God is. And so I think about, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I think thoughts about God. Hopefully God speaks to me. And so we, we kind of do this thing of connecting with God ongoing. But sometimes we don't understand kind of the, the foundation of the way that we kind of work with God or connect with God and why it determines the way we view God differently than maybe we should. So let me explain this. I think we make assumptions about the way we connect with God as the right way to connect with God or the way that's acceptable and never think to think maybe there's a different approach that I need to have in understanding who God is. For for example, so I I go out uh, three or four times a week and I go run and walk in the wash. Anybody ever been in the wash in Simi Valley? Or you want the nice name, the Arroyo, right? I don't know why we have that call that because it's a wash, right? So there's an interesting display of wildlife and trash. That's kind of the the, the makeup of the Simi Wash. But uh, so if you've been there, there's there's ducks and there's geese and there's crane. There's all kind of different kinds of birds and things. And so uh, if you're like me, when you're when you're on the path, you know you we have an agreement with the birds, right? They stay towards the water. We're on the path, and when we come their way, they go they walk away, right? Anybody know? Except for geese. Ducks got it, man. I come up on a duck, they kind of nod, and I nod, and they go their way, and I go my way. But geese are a whole different thing. And so a couple weeks ago, I was coming I was coming down the path, and I could see a, a goose that was up a di- little distance. And normally geese, when they're on the path, they're more towards the water than they are towards the fence where, the, where kind of the wash is, or away from the wash. And so, But this goose happened to be on the opposite side, away from the water. He was facing the water. And so I just kind of made a mental note. Okay, that's not normal. Usually I pass behind a goose, and we're good, but he's not. He's kind of facing. So I thought, we'll be fine. And so I got within 10 feet of this goose, And he turns, and he looks right at me, and he lowers his head, and he opens his beak, and he starts hissing at me. I thought, I've never seen this in a goose before, because I've never passed in front of one. I'm always behind. We have this agreement. I go behind. You go to the water. We're good. So he starts hissing at me. So I stop in my tracks. And I had just seen on the news a couple weeks before, I don't know if anyone saw this, there was a golfer who accidentally stumbled onto a nest. And Mama Goose got mad at him and literally chased him down the, the fairway, knocked him over, and he lost all his clubs. It was pretty funny to watch. And so right in that moment, this starts flashing through my head like, oh, no, here we go. And so I started to kind of step back a little bit. And here's the two things that came into my mind, fight and flight. That's exa- I thought, okay, first thought, okay, I'm bigger than the goose, even though he's a big bird. If he comes at me, can I take him on? Can I hit him, knock him out, push him away? And then I started, as he's hissing and getting louder and getting closer, I'm thinking, he's pretty nasty looking, and I don't know what a beak can do, but I don't want to find out. So then I thought to myself, if he keeps coming, I'm going to have to turn and run. And I'm thinking, can I outrun a goose? And so finally, as I'm backpedaling and I'm starting to think, okay, I'm about to take a step and turn and actually run from this goose, he actually turns and and raises his head back up and kind of keeps his eye on me, but then he starts going towards the water, so I stop. And so after I did, I went on the internet and I had to find out what is the, the, the appropriate way to approach a goose that's hissing at you. And I learned something very interesting. Both fight and flight are incorrect. I was going to do both. Either one of those were my options and neither one would have been good because they said if you, if you engage a goose that's hissing at you, they're already seeing you as aggressive. And so if you come up there anymore, they won't back down. They'll keep coming at you. They don't have this idea that you're bigger and they're smaller. So any sign of aggression, so if you're moving towards them rapidly, they'll come at you as well. They may get in the air and flap their wings and do all kind of crazy things. And the other thing they said, any kind of fast motion, like if you turn and run, that encourages them to chase. So they'll run after you. So if you come after them, they'll come after you. If you run away, they'll come after you. And the best thing you can do is basically stand your ground and slowly move away until they stop engaging you. So which was not an option I ended up and, and doing by mistake, but not on, and on purpose. Now, I know most of us don't think about, hmm, I'm, how am I going to engage a goose in my life if I've ever faced one? But now you know, right? So that's why the whole message is how do you engage a goose, right? The point is, is that you and I have certain instincts, certain assumptions about the way we connect and approach God that sometimes we don't realize are actually 
not what God desires for us in terms of how we relate to him. And I want us to understand that from a story that's probably familiar to most of you. If you have your Bibles, Luke uh, chapter 15. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three stories. The third one is the most famous one. We know it as the prodigal son. And in this story, we'll kind of read through it together, verses 11 uh, down to verse 32. Uh, Jesus tells a very important story uh, that, that I think all of us, please, what I want you to do, it's a little bit different. Today. We're going to kind of walk through characters of this story. We're gonna li- li- I want you to listen to the story because most of you, if you've been in church, you've heard this story in one form or another, if not just literally read it right out of Luke 15. Don't tune out because I think most of us think we know the story, but we don't really know the story. Most of us think we know how to engage God, but we don't really know how to engage God sometimes the way we think we do. So um, I'm going to read through this, and some of what we're just going to walk through, there's a, a, probably the best book ever written on this passage is a book called The Prodigal God by Tim Keller, an excellent book. He takes a whole book to go through what this story is really saying, and we'll draw some from uh, his book today. So, so let me read, starting in verse 15. This is Jesus, and it says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the field, his fields, to feed pigs." And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father said, saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, father, said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this was my son. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then they began to celebrate. Now, verse 25, the story goes on. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what what, what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him. He he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, uh, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So when you read that story, anybody heard that story before? Most of us have. When Jesus actually at the beginning of this chapter in verses 1 and 2, it says there's two specific groups of people that Jesus is talking to. On one side, he's got tax collectors and sinners. And on the other side, he's got religious leaders, Pharisees and scribes. Those two groups of people could not be further apart from each other. One were acknowledged as sinners and broken people. Tax collectors were marginalized because of their evil and their greed towards their own people. And Pharisees and scribes were kind of at the pinnacle of Jewish society because of their knowledge of the law and their understanding and authority. And so because of that, you had two different groups of people. And Jesus, in this story, is talking to both of them. The majority of us, when we read this passage, when the son comes home after he's gone off and wasted all of his father's money, that we think is the bulk of the story. It's the son that went and came back. That's actually half the story. And what I'd like to do uh, just for a few moments is go through the three characters, the younger son, the older son, and the father, and talk about some significant things about them in the story that helps us to understand clearly as we kind of move through this things that we do and th- assuming that we know how to en- engage or connect with God in our lives. So let's talk about the young, younger son at first. So one of the things that was true about him is that he wanted his inheritance. Now, there's a lot of history in this story that Jesus tells. He's telling this 2,000 years ago to a group of people who had a different understanding of the story than we do. So when he references that this, this son comes and re- demands his inheritance from his father, 
you have to understand what he's asking for. Because for us to understand what that means is that when you say to your father who's living, I want the inheritance that you're gonna, I'm going to get when you die, is to basically say, I would rather have you dead than alive. It wasn't just demanding some kind of uh, compensation or money, but he's literally saying to his dad, you're more valuable to me dead than you are alive, but I can't wait till you die, so I want my money now. What a great son, right? But that's what he's saying to his father. He, he wanted his inheritance, so he's, he's asking for this. And what's crazy, and we'll talk about what it really meant, the, the father gives into his request. He gives him a third of all that he has. And the second thing that the younger son wanted is he wanted his independence, he wanted his freedom. In fact, it says in, in verses 13 to 16, it says that he went out and he wasted the property that the father gave him, the money that the father gave him in reckless living. Reckless living, if you translate it, literally means to live without consequence. So to have this freedom that says, I'm going to do what I want to do, and it doesn't matter what happens around me or what happens to me. I don't want to have the restriction of rules and requirements and regulations. I want to live without any consequences. So he wanted his inheritance, he wanted his freedom or his independence, and then when he finally comes to his senses and he comes back to the father, what else, the other thing that he wanted to do is he wanted to earn his way back into his father's household, back into relationship with his father. And we'll see from, from the story, the father's not going to let him do that, but what does he say? He doesn't say, I'm just going to go back on my hands and knees and be a slave. He actually says, I'm going to be one of my father's hired men. So if my dad can pay me, then I can go back in and I can earn my way. Because when it says in the passage that he went home, home is not just a house. Home is not a location. Home is relationship. Home is connection. Home is being accepted. So he, in his mind, thinks, I've blown it. I've walked away from my father. I've, I've lost a third of his wealth. And the only way I can get back into favor with him is if I work off my debt. If I earn back the relationship that I lost because of my bad decision. So that's the, the younger son. Now, just for a moment, think about the older son. You get to the second half of the story. There are three things that are true of him. The first thing of the older son is he was faithful. When his dad goes outside of the banquet and he's talking to him, he actually says this to his dad in verse 29. He says, I've served you all these years. What is he saying? He's saying to his dad, I didn't leave. I didn't go anywhere. I stayed put. And I've been faithful all these years to work the field, to serve the household, to be present with you. I've never gone anywhere. I have been faithful. So he's, in a sense, he's making his case to his dad, which leads to the second thing, and that he was obedient. Listen to what he says. This is, this is a really powerful phrase. He says, I never disobeyed your command. What is he saying to his dad? I'm perfect. He's, he's comparing between his younger brother and himself, and he's saying, listen, my brother went out and did all this stuff, but I've never disobeyed you. Anything you've ever asked me to do, I've obeyed. I'm perfect before you because I've always done what you've asked me to do. Sounds like a pretty amazing guy, but there's a problem because there's a third thing that's true about him. Not only was he faithful, not only was he obedient, but you know what he was? He was self-righteous. In verse 28, when he comes in from the field and one of the servants says, yeah, your brother who is gone, he's back, he refuses to go in. And the reason he refuses to go in is because he's too good for his brother. He's been faithful, he's been obedient, he's been present. And now his sinful brother, which it's crazy, he says, he says the one who wasted your property or devoured your property with prostitutes is in that party and there is no way I am going in there to celebrate him. Why? Because I'm right and he's wrong. I've been faithful, I've served you, I've been obedient, he's been disloyal, disobedient, and he left. I'm right, he's wrong, and I refuse to go in. So when you take those two brothers in comparison, you realize something really important about both of them. Both of them missed it. Both of them didn't get it. In fact, it's when we start to understand about the father that the picture starts to get a little bit more clear for us. So there's a few things that you and I need to understand about the father and what he did, because sometimes we don't pick it up in the story. What, what did the father do in the middle of this? Well, he sacrificed. So in verse 12, when it says that he, he divided his property, again, property for us, the default for property is what is our possessions, our household, our car, the things that we own, our bank account. That's kind of what we would think about. But in that day and age, in fact, if you take the literal translation of the word property right out of this passage, it's the word bios, which is the word that means from which life comes. So property in, in the first century when Jesus was saying, speaking this, this parable was your life. It was your identity. It was your status in the community was to have property. And so it wasn't just a piece of physical land that you had. It was actually what represented who you were. So when the son, the younger son comes to the father and says, yeah, I, I demand one third, which is as the younger son, he gets one third, the older gets two thirds. 
he was basically, he knew what he was saying, but what he was asking the father to do is he's asking the father to literally tear his life apart because he was going to have to give up one third of his wealth. That means he had to go sell off a third of his property, which means to cash in on his identity and he couldn't get it back. And so when you think about that, you think, oh, he just wanted money. And so his, his father just went to the bank account and handed him some money and off he went. No, no, no. This changed his father's life forever. Because that one third is gone and part of his identity in the community and part of who he is and his status is now gone with that to do what? To be devoured with prostitutes by his younger son. But what's crazy is this father does that. He gives up a third of his wealth for this son who's going to go and waste it all in what the Bible says, reckless living. Second thing that's true about the father is he sacrificed, but he also is the one who initiates so in both situations with both brothers, so the younger one comes back, and you remember the, the picture. So he says he's coming back, and at a distance, his father sees him. He sees him way out in the distance. And so what's the father's response? Does he stand there with his arms crossed and his foot tapping like, boy, I can't wait till he gets back here because he's going to get it, right? That's what most of us would do, right, as a parent? You're like, you know how much trouble you're in? You're going to pay for this. But what does he do? He sees his son, and instinctively he runs. Now, you and I think, oh, he runs. Well, in the first century, patriarchs didn't run. They didn't run. Kids ran and played, and athletes ran and participated and competed, but father's patriarchs didn't run because in that day and age, what we would probably consider, guys, the equivalent of wearing a dress is what he would wear. He's wearing a robe, and when you run in a robe, you can't just run. You have to lift your robe up, and when you lift your robe up, what do you do? You expose everything pretty much from the, from the knee down. And that you just didn't do that in, in, in the first century. And so for him to run meant that he pulls up his robe and he starts running so he can do what? So he can, he can, can embrace his son. He's initiating. He's not waiting on his terms for his son to come back so he can make him pay. He's running after him and when he sees him. And then the other thing that's true is the older son, he also initiates with the older son, the self-righteous one who's outside. He literally leaves the party he's throwing for his younger son who's come home. Can you imagine if you're so overjoyed that your child was lost and now they're found and you're celebrating this party, but your loser older son is outside and he won't come in. So you don't want to leave the party. But what do you do? Because you love your older son, you leave the party and you go outside. And it says that he entreated or he pleaded with him to come in. You need to come and join the party in the celebration of what we're experiencing. So he's initiating, even though the older brother and the younger brother both missed it, what is the father doing? He's still pursuing his kids. He's still going after them, which leads to the third reality of what he did is that he accepted. And particularly we see this, and this is where we'll talk about kind of the tension Jesus leaves us in with this parable. But the younger son, what does he do? So when he runs and he hugs him and he kisses him and he brings him back in, and, and remember, what's the first thing that the the younger son says, he's like, okay, I'm back, dad. I've sinned. I've blown it. And in his mind, his next step is I'm going to be a hired guy. I'm going to earn off the debt that I've, I've created. And his father, almost when you read the story, it's almost so his father just completely ignores what he's saying. He says, get him a robe, get him a ring, and put shoes on his feet. So there's something very significant about what his father's saying. When he said to get the ring, he wasn't just saying just get a random piece of jewelry or ring and put it on his hand. In that day and age, there was a signet ring that represented every family. And when you entered into a contract, you didn't sign your name. You actually used the seal on the top of the signet ring to actually, that was your name. That was your identity. You would place your seal on the contract saying, I endorse that, or this is my identity and my signature. And so what the father was saying is he's saying, get the signet ring that represents our family and put it on my son's hand once again. That was powerful. He's saying, you are out of the family, you were lost, but now you're back, and now you're one of the family. So instead of saying, okay, yeah, you can come in and be one of the hired guys, he says, no, 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 you're my son. I'm going to grant you that. I'm not going to let you earn your way back in. I'm actually going to let you be a, a part of the family. I'm going to accept you. And that ring was very significant in doing that. So, so understanding these three characters, I want us to, to capture something. This is where we're, we hope, we wish is the way, if we wrote the parable, we would, we would end it differently. When you read the end of the parable, there's no resolve for the older brother. You don't think, oh, he finally comes to his senses, he lets go of his self-righteousness, and he joins the party. We don't have that. It just ends with it kind of unresolved. But when you and I think about both of these brothers, it's really important for us to see both of their perspectives, because both of them were doing the same thing, but doing it in a different way. So the younger son, they were both about one thing. They were about controlling their father to get his stuff. They wanted their father's things, but they didn't want their father. So the younger son does it what? He does it through disobedience. He does it through rebellion, and he does it by leaving. The older son does the same thing, and he controls by what? Obeying the rules, being obedient, and staying. 
But neither one of them were concerned about the father. They were concerned about the father's things. In fact, it's interesting when the father says to the older son, everything I have is yours. He literally means that because when he divided up his property to give a third to his younger son, the two thirds automatically defaulted to the older son. So the father, in a sense, didn't even have his own possession. He had already given it over to his older son. And so because of that, they, there's this idea that they had no concern for their father, but they just wanted the father's stuff. Now, here's where it gets interesting for us. That means that you and I, and we think that we're engaging God even through the younger son, which is, I'm broken, I've sinned, I've failed, so I come back to God and I try to earn his favor again. Or the older son, which I stay faithful, I remain true, I remain obedient, and I somehow get God to give me what I want because I've been a good person. Both of those realities miss who God is. Both of those don't engage God. Both of those actually miss God completely. That means that through our good behavior and our bad behavior, we can still miss God. Isn't that great news? Aren't you glad that you came to church in the park? Now remember at the beginning of the passage in verses 1 and 2, Jesus was speaking to two groups of people, tax collectors and sinners and, ph and Pharisees and scribes. Obviously, you can tell who's represented in the story by who. And this is what's important for you and I today to think about. That's why I wanted to do something different. I want us to think about this. So that means, particularly so if you're, you represent the younger, maybe that's been your journey in life. Maybe there's been seasons where you've tried to engage God and you try to follow Jesus, but then you just go back to the way that you used to live. Whatever it is, you find yourself in addiction again. You find yourself living out a sinful life. You've kind of lived out the typical journey of, of kind of falling away from Jesus. And so, so in, in different points, you've come back. And when you come back, you try to engage again and you try to work really hard and be a really good person and only to fall away again. You're the younger brother. But what about probably most of us, we fall into the older brother category. And that is what? Say, hey, I, I go to church. I pray. I give. I read my Bible. I serve sometimes. I'm a really good person. And you know, when we say that, you know what we're saying to God? We're saying to God, I've been so good. You owe me a good life. You owe me an easy life. You owe me an eternity in heaven with you. Why? Because I've been a good person. So when Jesus was talking to tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees and scribes, you know what he was saying to all of them? You're all lost. Because you think that you can control God by your activity and your behavior. But you've missed the point. The point is not what God gives you. The point is God himself. And for us to get to a point where God is all that we desire. Jesus is all that we want in life is to understand the way that God wants us to engage him. When we think that we're going to do something in order to get God to behave a certain way, then what we're saying to God is, you're not important to me, but your stuff is what I'm after. So how many times do we say this? And please forgive me, I don't try to offend, but how many times do you say, well, you want to live that way because you want God to bless you? What are you saying? I'm going to work really hard to make God obligated to give me good things in this life. Blessing can never be the goal. Blessing is the byproduct of getting God himself. And when blessing becomes the goal, we've missed who God is. So when you're thinking, well, that's great, Pastor John. Thanks for encouraging me this morning. So how do we, how do we resolve that for us? Especially the majority of us, like me, who I would probably fit into the older brother category. How do we resolve that? Three things I want, I want to close with this, because I think I'm smelling tacos right now. I hope that's what I'm smelling. The first thing is this. What do we do? We, we have to realize that whether you're the older brother or the younger brother, whether you're disobedient or you're obedient, God still pursues you. God still initiates and he comes after you. Even in your self-righteousness, God comes after you. Even in your unrighteousness, God comes after you. Because the wonderful thing about who God is, is he never, ever, ever leaves us alone. You can't get away from him. You can't hide from him. You can't run far enough away so that he doesn't harass you or come after you. Why? Because his love constantly initiates. Realize that. So wherever you are today, whether you are in a state of self-righteousness and you think you're good, guess what? God's still pursuing you. Why? Because he looks at your self-righteousness and says it's not good enough. It's not going to get you what you think that you desire. Second thing is that both of us, whether the younger or the older, the, uh, uh, the unrighteous or the self-righteous, that we have to repent which means we have to turn away from our mindset of how we've engaged God and realize there's another way. And that means if you've been living in sinful behavior and you know it's sinful, then God's calling you to a place where you say, you know what, I need to offer over my sin and my brokenness and ask for forgiveness and repent from that and then take a step in the opposite direction. Not because I want somehow God's stuff, but because ultimately what will answer to my soul is Jesus himself. 
But then for the rest of us, those, the older brother, the self-righteous, do you know what we have to repent from? We have to repent from the very motive to be self-righteous. The very motive inside of us which says, listen, I'm going to be good because then God's going to do things good for me and I'm going to obligate God because I'm a good person, therefore he has to do that. And what God is saying, if, you, if we're going to get this right, then Jesus is saying, you and I have to repent as much as the unrighteous person. We have to repent for our unrighteousness and repent from our self-righteousness. And in the story, Jesus tends to lean heavier on the self-righteousness and how evil that is. Why? Because it's deceiving that we can be good, moral, church-going, Bible-believing, Bible-reading, praying people and still never engage who God is. Why? Because we're just trying to obligate him. Jesus wants us. He doesn't want what we represent. He wants us, and we should desire and want him, which leads to the third thing. And then I'll, I'll pray and I'll close. Remember how much it costs to bring you home. So in this story, there's a high price that the father pays. This is what's crazy, and this is, what's this, this is the thing that we don't understand. Because as a father, you think, well, why didn't the father just stop his son? Why did he not let him have his inheritance? Why didn't he just say, no, I'm not going to give you the money, so you can't go anywhere, so you have to save me? Why did he give him the third of his wealth, and why did he let him go? Because his father loved his son. See, because one of the things that God will never do is he'll never force you to love him, but he will always love you. So that means that he will always give you the freedom to make a choice because relationship and love is never out of obligation. It's only a choice that you and I make. So what God does is that he, his, he, throughout the whole journey of this story and throughout our lives, God constantly sacrifices for us. This story, this father, what sacrifices his identity in the community for the sake of his son. But then when his son comes home, this is what we don't understand too, when they went out and they killed the fattened calf, this was huge. This was like a once-in-a-lifetime banquet. It wasn't just a family occurrence. It was an entire village. Everybody got invited. Why? Because this was like the top-end banquet that you could go to. So this was a very costly, very expensive thing that the father was doing as he brought his, back, his son back in to celebrate. And so remembering the cost, but what translates for us is what's the cost for our engaging God? Jesus' life his crucifixion and his resurrection, which is the price and the sacrifice that God made on our behalf so that we would not get God's stuff, but we would get God himself. And so with those three things today, I want you just to think through, maybe ask yourself the question, have I been the younger brother? Have I been the older brother? Have I been the unrighteous one? Or have I been the self-righteous one? And then today, embrace another way. Want God for who God is, not for what he represents or what he can give you. Because when you get God, you get everything that you're going to need anyway. Because he takes care of our lives. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this story that you have told. That Lord, it, it, it transcends the times, Lord. Even though it was 2,000 years ago, it still applies to us today. And so, Jesus, we thank you for this this different context that we're in today that we can, might be able to think differently about the way that we engage you. So, Lord, if we've lived in unrighteousness, please forgive us. We want to turn from those ways and follow you. But, Lord, if we lived in self-righteousness, Lord, I pray today we would sacrifice and surrender our self-righteousness because we don't want our righteousness. We want your righteousness. So in doing that, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be people who are not fighting the goose or running from the goose but we are engaging the way, Lord, that the goose needs to be engaged in order to bring peace. So, Lord Jesus, we are engaging you today the way that you've called us to engage you so that we might know you in everything of who you are. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the food that we're about to eat. We pray, Lord, your blessing over our time of fellowship and community together. In Jesus' name, amen.